Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Committee on Higher Education, along with the Committee on Energy, Economic Development, and Tourism. We are here today is Thursday, February 11th in room 229 for a two o'clock agenda joint hearing with the two committees. Before we get started, I hope you take care of some housekeeping announcements. This meeting, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You'll find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature, legislature's website. This Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event will include the following agendas, 3 p.m. higher ed and uh, EET, Economic Energy, Economic Development and Tourism Committees, and at 305, just the Higher Education Committee. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Tuesday, February 16th at 3.05 p.m. and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For people participating remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until shortly before it is your turn to testify. Test testifiers will be limited to two minutes each at the end of the two minutes, the audio will be automatically muted. I will be reading a list of people who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closed captioning does not accurately transcribe the names. It's not our fault. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website. You will find a link on the status page for the measure. If there are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. We appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee has your written testimony. So with that, we will begin our joint hearing with Senate Bill 1421 relating to dual use technology. This bill creates a task force within the University of Hawaii and the Department of Business and Economic Development and Tourism that explores how dual use technology can be used to promote economic recovery and diversity and diversify the state's economy and it makes appropriations. And our first testifier is Vasilis from the University of Hawaii in support. Vasilis, are you here? No. no. Uh, Len Higashi from HTDC in support. Uh Stand on our testimony uh, in support of this measure. Available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mike McCartney from DBED has comments. Judy Morris from Oceanet Laboratories in support. Judy. For Ian, Ian Kitajima. Not here. Okay, is that Ian? Ian. Hi, Good Ian. afternoon, sorry. Good afternoon, Chair. Members, uh, Ian Kitajima from Oceanet. Yeah, sorry, I'm driving. <laughs> sorry, I'm paying attention well, to the road. To yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we stand on support of, of this measure. Thank you. Okay, Isa, Isa Motafanelzad. I'm sorry if I, if I noted that name from Maui Scientific in support, Todd Robinson. Also in support, Steve Brennan in support, and Regina Gregory uh, has comments. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, members, we are open for questions, discussion. Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, Ian, could you um, give us a fair understanding what the potential is for dual use technology in the state? Um, particularly how many companies might stand to benefit if we do pursue, pursue this initiative further. I, I, uh, so thank you. Um, thank you for the question. I, I think over the last, you know, I wanna say 10 years ago, the industry was pretty vibrant. Uh, I think today, you know, when we used to host an annual gatherings, we, we would have, um, at the time, the industry was, was quite large, over a hundred companies. Um, it's changed over the years, um, and so I think we're trying to re restart the industry because it has so much promise. Uh, because 
essentially we're tapping into federal research and development dollars to develop uh, innovations and we're doing it in the state of Hawaii. And so the monies we typically do are, we're bringing it in from the federal government. So what, that's kind of nice and we're kind of importing federal dollars into the state and doing high tech development work here. So it's, it's very promising, but I think, um, you know, we really want to restart that, especially now because of the because of all the things that have happened with the pandemic. Um, so I, I want to say it's really small again. The industry is not as large as it used to be, but it has, I think, the potential and the promise that uh, could really benefit Hawaii in the long term. I think with the governor's message and everyone's support of trying to diversify and do more innovation and technology, uh, I think the dual use industry is, um, I think, one of those promising industries that that we should kind of restart and get refocused on. Thank you, Ian. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Ian, can you give us uh, examples of what some of these promising uh, ventures might be? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think one of the folks that testified sent in uh, Isar uh, from who, who founded Nalu Scientific. Actually, Isar is a uh, PhD student, I met him at the University of Hawaii, and, and I was unfortunate in recruiting him to Oceanet, but I think what was good is, is um, Isar actually started his own company, and, which is exciting, right? So he, he started his own high-tech company in Hawaii, and he's basically funded the creation of that company through federal SBIR grants, so basically small, you know, small business innovation research grants that started off as, you know, phase one grants for $150,000, but now has grown it into, and those have led to what are called phase twos, which are upwards of over a million dollars to develop some real core technologies that he's developing for the U.S. military, but has applications in other areas as well. And so um, I think he has maybe a little bit less, maybe around 10, 10 to 12 employees now. And, and he, I think he's a really great example of somebody who was at the University of Hawaii. I promise we, at the time, Ocean, we, we, we couldn't find a place for him, but he, he actually participated in that program and in the SBR program and actually was able to start and fund his own company. And those technologies that he's developing, right, are initially developed for mili potentially military applications, but they also have civilian applications. And I think that's what's, exciting about dual use is, is you're doing really cutting edge technology development that in, in some ways only the federal government would fund. Even VCs, venture capital people would not fund these kinds of innovations because they're too risky. So the federal government essentially allows small businesses to, to really focus on innovation, develop it and maintain the intellectual property. So the beauty of the federal SBI program is that it it actually tries to help small businesses develop intellectual property that they can own, which they can then take into back into the federal government. But to me, the real, the real opportunity for our Hawaii companies is to take those innovations and apply it to civilian applications, either in products or services. And in our case at OceanEd, we're, we do a lot of licensing now. We used to spin out lots of companies, but what we do now is actually a partner with bigger companies from around the world, take that intellectual property that the federal government funded and actually work with these companies around the world to, to transition those technologies into products and services in these much larger, bigger organizations. And some of our clients now include, include you know, Shell Energy and, and Chevron and basically develop those technologies into products and services that they can use. And then basically we now we have a built-in licensing partner. Okay. So now we're like technologies to these bigger companies and basically we're getting uh, licensing revenues coming back to the state of Hawaii. Thank you. Hope well, that helps. The members, any other? I have a question. Senator Agaron. Yeah, this, this question is probably for either Len at HTDC or to Ian. Um, in Oceanet's testimony, they mention a dual-use group that used to be um, active. So I, I'm just curious on what is the additional value in forming a task force in DBED 
if there all, there already is a community that's out there that has some kind of structure already. Len, you want to, I don't know, Len, you want to go first or? Uh, like for example, does it does it make it easier to access federal uh, federal support or other kinds of support to have something formal that's attached to a state agency like DBED? Uh, if if you don't mind, um, may I answer? Mm. This is Len. Hi, Len Len Higashi with HTDC. So I, in our testimony, we were kind of pointing out. Uh, a lot of the efforts with the Small Business Innovation Research SBIR program, as you know, when we're talking about dual use, the the military side of the of the dual has a huge SBIR component, and that's like a core program for us that we do, um, providing matching grants to companies and also the services to help them commercialize. You know, I think with the dual use priority, that is HTDC is actually top priority is taking these companies and getting them into commercial success. I think with the task force and the report that's required is more of an acknowledgement of this is a huge opportunity for the state. You know, we do a lot of reporting on the federal, federal funds that are coming into the state. I think our last report showed $53 million. You know, the state uh, provides matching grant funds and the state put in, I think, $1.5 million and, and these companies Len, can you answer the question? I believe he asked you about the um, task force. The, the task force would be an acknowledgement that this is a uh, priority and would organize, you know, uh, in a formal way, the university and, and HTDC and uh, the other stakeholders. Uh, DBED asked us to, to represent them on this, uh, on this call as well. Then Algorand, does that answer your question? <laughs> well, not really. I mean, I'm still wondering, you know, if the private sector already is doing something. I just want to know what added value there is to create a task force as opposed to, you know, allowing uh, uh, the people in the industry to go ahead and form their own groups to, you know, make contacts and to, um, and I'm just trying to get a sense of what's the, what's the difference between this and the dual use group that is alluded to in Oceanet's testimony. Should I, con should I continue, Ian, or do you want to uh, chair? Uh, you know, I, I, well, we I, can uh, answer the question, but Ian, uh, I think you need to pull over if you're still driving. It, it really is um, <laughs> not something that we are promoting that you drive into Zoom at the same time. <laughs> Judy, maybe you can answer. So I think um, what Ian's going to say is that. Um, <laughs> okay, do, I, I will pull oh. over right now. Um, I, I think yeah. to answer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So. So yeah. I, I sorry. I'm, I'm actually parked and stopped. Um, to answer the senator's question, I, I think. The, the group that we've organized has been a, you know, we meet monthly. I think to, to build on what Len is saying, I think if, if there's a formalization of, you know, like a formal, you know, from a government standpoint, this is part of each, you know, this is under HTDC and DBED, that it gives it a, a kind of a le legitimacy. So when we do have conversations with potentially federal agencies or other folks, that we can kind of say that there really is a focus and an importance of the dual use industry in Hawaii. Right now, we're kind of, you know, we've actually just restarted uh, this, uh, the group. We've been kind of dormant for the last few years. And so um, I think part of it is just, you know, we, we'll continue to do that piece, which is the informal piece, but formalizing it at some level may give us legitimacy when we talk to federal agencies. Thank you, Chair. Welcome, Senator. Um, Hi, uh, I just following up on this. What, what's preventing this from occurring now? Why, why, 
I think which comes back to the last few questions. Why can't we do the, why can't the dual use agreements occur now? If, if I can answer, I, I, believe, I believe some of it is already happening it, and just want to share. Uh, we did not introduce this bill, but we definitely support it and uh, appreciate its acknowledgement of the opportunity for Hawaii and, and the priority that we're doing. It is requesting uh, a formal report and targeting additional sectors, which we're happy to comply with. And it does uh, include an appropriation to do so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Len, I just wanted to ask about the appropriation part. The bill asked for $25,000 for a group that traditionally has met on their own with no public funding. Can we take the appropriation out and can you still put the task force together? I think in some ways the task force is, you know, the, the dual use group is still meeting. The appropriation was to generate a report back to the legislature and, and address some of the opportunities that are out there. So it was appreciated. Well, I don't think we need a $25,000 report. We could probably do it in two pages. So um, I, I, thank, thank you. Thank you, members. Any other questions, discussion? If not, thank you all very much. Uh, members, I'm not gonna go into a break room. I think we can decide on a decision right now in, in the open. I'm, I'm leaning to recommending that uh, we delete out the $25,000 out of the um, appropriation section and chances of the bill passing would be a lot greater. And also some technical and non-substantive um, amendments to, for the purpose of clarity and consistency. Uh, any questions, any added, what do you wanna add anything, Chair? Anything? If not, Okay, uh, we will go into decision making. The uh, Committee on Higher Education recommends to pass out uh, Senate Bill 1421 with amendments, as I mentioned, uh, deleting out the appropriation and also adding technical and non substantive amendments. Any discussion? If not, Chair will sign. Senate Bill 1421 passed with amendments, Chair will sign. Uh, Senator Keith Alderon. Aye. Senator Wakai. Yes. Senator Favela. Aye. Thank you very much. For the Committee on Energy, Economic Development, and Tourism, same recommendation to pass this measure with amendments. Any discussion? I don't see heard none. Um, Senator B. Salucci, I vote yes. Committee on Energy, Economic Development, and Tourism related to SB 1421. Chair recommends I or pass with amendments. Chair votes I. Vice Chair votes I. Uh, Senator Lee excuse. Senator Riviere. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Your recommendation is adopted, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. This ends the joint committee hearing and we will go right into the higher education committee. And we will begin with Senate Bill. 358. Okay, Senate Bill 358 relating to the University of Hawaii establishes an organized research unit for, I'm sorry. 358 is relating to the college savings program, establishes a state income tax deduction for eligible contributions made to any college savings program under section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code, applies to taxable years after 1231-2020. First up to testify is Isaac Choi from Department of Taxation. Is Isaac here? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Uh, Josh Michaels on behalf of the Director. Uh, the Department will stand on its testimony offering comments. Okay, don't go anywhere, Josh. I'm sure we have questions. Craig Kirai from Department of Budget and Finance. His comments. Kim Chamberlain from the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association to support. Tony Goodrum, Society's Industry of Ho Association of Hawaii in support. And Elizabeth Bishop, individual in support. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? There are none. Uh, members, any uh, questions of the Department of Taxation since they're the only one here? 
I have a couple of questions. So how, is, there, is there an estimate as to what this is going to cost in the way it, the bill is written right now? Uh, that we, we don't currently have those figures, but by the time, uh, if, this, if the committee advances this bill, we anticipate they'll be ready before uh, they reach um, Ways and Means. Okay, is there any, any estimate, I mean, any wild, just a guess as to what we're talking about? Um, given, given that, you know, in, in theory, depending on how expensive tuition is and, you know, the, the circumstances of that, um, it's, really, it's really hard to come up with a, a rough estimate uh, at this time. Our, our position is really based on the fact that uh, Essentially, this money would become non-taxable on both ends and double taxation. Less, less the specific revenue or without without knowing the specific revenue figures, we can at least be confident in that. Right. So according to one of the testifiers, it's saying by opening it up to all, uh, all five to nine college savings plans, that the cost would be high and mm -hmm. unknown revenue loss as the number of state filing individuals that have the nation's 100, five, 100 529 plans and may be substantial. Can you tell us currently how much the current um, college savings um, statute that we have now on the books, what does that cost us? Um. That, unfortunately, I do not have, but I'd be happy to talk to tax research and planning and get that over to the committee ASAP. Okay, yeah, I wish you folks would, would have that information for us because in this time um, of revenue shortage, we really want to know what the liability may be. Remember Understood. That? Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Okay, the next item we are on is Senate Bill 589 relating to the University of Hawaii establishes an organized research unit for the cancer research within the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine. And uh, we have testifying Michael Bruno from the University of Hawaii in opposition. Are you Mr. Bruno? Aloha Chair and good afternoon, um, Vice Chairs, members. I, I should begin by thanking all of you for everything you continue to do on behalf of higher education in Hawaii and on behalf of the University of Hawaii in these uh, especially challenging, but also I believe formative times for the university. President Lassner and I will respectfully stand on our written testimony in opposition to this bill. Um, I just want to add, the two of us recognize the need for continuing work to seek efficiencies um, uh, and other areas, more areas of collaboration between the UH Cancer Center and the John A. Burns School of Medicine. However, we don't believe that a change in the leadership structure is in any way a path to achieve those efficiencies. Um, both organizations require and currently have very strong leaders and we need those leaders in place to raise the profile, raise the essential funding and contribute to better healthcare outcomes for the people of Hawaii. Uh, we look forward to working with the committee towards that end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Adelia Dunn from the Alana Dunn Research Foundation in opposition. Eric Abe, Hawaii Primary Care Association in support. Lori Chan, Friends of UH Cancer Center in opposition. Blake Oshiro, also opposition from Hawaii Society of Clinical Oncology. Lynn Wodo, University of Hawaii Foundation opposed. Cynthia Au, American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network Pacific comments. Sonji Park, an individual opposed. Joe Ramos, 
Mr. Joe is here. Yes. We're almost, thank you. Uh, aloha Chair Kim and Vice Chair Kadani. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you guys today. I am at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. I'm a professor here. Um, I do also wanna make, take this moment to thank you so much for all the work you're doing on behalf of the people and the students of Hawaii at this incredibly difficult time with all the challenges that COVID-19 has brought. Um, and I know that you've uh, received a lot of testimony from the Cancer Center. I think when I last counted, you had over 20 something pieces of testimony from our faculty here. I definitely would encourage you to look through those. It's a number of different perspectives on this uh, with a lot of valuable insights, I think, and, um, and, uh, and thoughts. Uh, you know, like you, the Cancer Center faculty are working tirelessly to try and help Hawaii. Our mission is to reduce the burden of cancer here for the people uh, and improve cancer prevention and diagnosis and treatment in Hawaii. Uh, I also appreciate your improving efficiencies and accountability. That's something that I take closely to heart. It's something that I think is a continuing process. We're always refining how we approach efficiencies and accountability. Um, and uh, I'm sure that that was part of the reason that you put this bill forward is that you really thought that this could help. Uh, and I wanna try and uh, tell you at least very briefly, just a couple of things here, why I think in fact, it does the opposite. It's going to uh, 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 reduce efficiency um, here and will actually cost us some money over time. I've been here about 16 years. I started out as a program director in cancer biology here, moved into the ADA, the associate director uh, position under Jairus Hedges. So I work closely with Jairus. Uh, and then currently I work with the director, Randy Holcomb and his deputy director and the chief scientific officer here. Uh, just for completeness, I also am on the board of directors with the union, UPA. I have a secondary appointment in Jabson. I teach a lot over there. I run a class over there. We also do a lot of undergraduate teaching here at the University of Hawaii. We have two programs that we're really proud of right now that are fairly recent that we've started with the undergrads and we're working on some more things. Um, I know the finances here really, really well because of this, you know, and I also know Jabson really, really well. Um, and uh, because of my experience with the NCI designation, I know that quite well. I actually review other NCI designated cancer centers as part of the things that I do. Um, and I've been involved in writing our NCI designated um, grants the last two times through. So I've really been very heavily engaged in that. And so the, the, the couple of things I wanna really draw your attention to is first, we don't see any real financial savings here. If anything, there's probably a financial hit as we reorganize everything. I know we, we put this white paper together. You'll see that I and others have referenced it. I do wanna make the point that that white paper is now four or five years old. Like any kind of uh, document like that, it, it doesn't age well. The current on the ground is a little bit different. At that time, we actually were running deficits. We needed to increase efficiencies. We started looking for ways to do that and we actually came up with a lot of them and we put those in place. So now we actually are starting much better off. Um, and, uh, and the other part of it is the NCI changed what they require for the designation just this past year or so. Going forward, they're gonna require that the director absolutely is at the level of- time is up. Okay. Well, thank you for allowing me to hear that. Please look at my testimony um, and, uh, and look at those of the others. Thanks again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, members, we do have approximately 20 more individuals that is in opposition. I'm not gonna read all their names because they're not signed up for, for, for Zoom. Uh, we also have with us uh, Ben Kudo, the chair of the region with us. And I'm not sure if um, anyone else from the university is on on Zoom. Um, so uh, we will, I will open with questions. So Mr. Bruno. Yes, Chair. I know in your testimony, uh, you uh, wrote that while the legislature has reserved the right to legislate matters of state, statewide concern, it is neither appropriate nor necessary for the legislature to submit to substitute its opinions on this specific matter of internal structure and management for, re reason, for the reasons viewed by the UH. So you're saying that uh, this bill reflects our opinions? And what, we were, what we were discussing was the role of the legislature versus the role of the Board of Regents in establishing and approving the uh, organizational structure of the university, the, the establishment of the Cancer Center as a standalone organized research unit is many decades ago um, by the, by the uh, University of Hawaii Board of Regents. And, 
And so we believe that in this case, as well as, as, as you're aware, and the other committee members are aware, we're in the process of a major reorganization of the campus. And so legislation like this then begs the question, whose responsibility is it to review and approve these major reorganizations, which are intended to make the university more efficient and effective. I appreciate that because didn't UH commission the Warburg Consulting Partners? Didn't the Manuel Chancellor and UH President secure the services of Warburg in the fall of 2015? That precedes my time here. I think Chair Kudo was around then, but I, okay. I just want to I want to say that as uh, Dr. Ramos indicated, uh, that's light years ago in terms of where the Cancer Center and JABSA are today, but I'll defer to Regent Kudo on that. Um, Regent Kudo, how much did we pay for that, uh, that study, the Warburg Consultant study? Um, I'm familiar with the Warburg study, but I don't know exactly how much it, it cost because it wasn't commissioned by the regions. It was commissioned okay, by- So we paid several thousand, hundred thousands of dollars for this Warburg study that proximity. Wasn't one of the recommendations was to transform the consortium to include governance role for partners that would include some combination of UH, Jobson, and local hospitals? Wasn't that one of the recommendations that you folks then went on further to do reports on? Uh, yeah, I think uh, at that time in 2015-2016, uh, um, the administration and the board was looking at reducing the, um, the fiscal deficit that the cancer center was uh, incurring. Um, and so uh, part of the recommendation that the uh, board and the administration came up with was to um, uh, eliminate um, operational and administrative redundancies between the medical school and the cancer center. And that uh, they wanted to combine um, and redundancies were included in, like in terms of administrative services, uh, maintenance, security, um, uh, accounting department and th those kinds of things could be uh, unified to save uh, some costs uh, for, the bo well, for the cancer center and the medical center. Okay, so this report that I'm holding up right now that says University of Hawaii Cancer Center proposed business plan update, um, proposed business plan for the University of Hawaii Board of Regents. Is that the report that you folks did? Yeah, we, um, um, in 2015, I believe, um, uh, it could be wrong, 2016, excuse me, February 2016, the uh, uh, independent audit committee of which I was a vice chair and uh, 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 appointed myself and uh, Regent Portnoy to do a... several years talking about this. You came up with a report. You came up with the UH Cancer Center meeting notes February 23 that says uh, this plan to be implemented over the next five year period to 2021. There's 10 items on here and I'm not sure how many of those items were actually done, but it's not our opinion. It's the fact that these are things that the university had been talking about seriously and never pulled the trigger never decided to do this. And so because of that, this is why we're here. And you know, 2016 and 15 may be light years away, as Mr. Bruno, you said. However, the financial situation is pretty much the same or worse than what it was in 2016 and 2015. And so now more than ever, we need to look at some of these savings and some of these ways that we can consolidate 
um, efficiencies. And you Excuse folks me, can, Kim? Yes. Can we take a quick recess? We have technical difficulties on our end. Okay, we're going to take a short recess, give time for the university to, to mull over what I just said. So you guys can come back and let us know which of these 10 items was actually implemented. Um, okay, we're going to go into a short recess. We're coming back to order after some technical difficulty. And um, let's see, where were we at? I was talking about the fact that the university themselves commissioned the study and the Board of Regents themselves investigated and also came up with recommendations on maybe not a total consolidation, but certainly consolidation of some of the, some of the services and um, actually had a bridge business plan to be implemented over the next five year period. So uh, Regent Kudo, is any of those 10 items uh, consolidate administrative services between Jobson and UHCC? One, two, review units, productive versus non-productive. Three, renegotiate with NCI and NCI designation. Four, reduce non-essential individuals, RCOH, cigarette tax funded. Mitigate fixed costs of the center. Rent available space at the center to governmental agencies at a discounted rate. Refinance revenue bonds in 2021. Only hire extramurally funded researchers going forward, non tenure track. Nine, reassignment of existing tenure track faculty. And 10, request for legislative funds of roughly 2.0 to 2.5 million going forward. Now, I'm sure that's something you folks have requested, the number 10, but of the other nine, uh, and certainly again, you know, some of the bills we've introduced is not our opinions, but it's based on these things that you folks said you were going to do and have not done. Yeah, in, uh, th this was the plan of the regions in 2016. Uh, at this time, uh, the existing executive director, uh, Professor Carboni, stepped down from his position as head of the Cancer Center and um, uh, uh, Dean Jarris of the medical school was the interim director. Uh, but uh, what happened was that be with the uh, NCI designation uh, renewal of that particular uh, license or, or certificate being coming up pretty soon, uh, they, they needed to find somebody to uh, replace Carboni permanently. And so a search was uh, commenced to find a replacement for Professor Carboni to be the new executive director. Uh, at that time, uh, I believe that this particular plan was put on hold because they wanted to make sure that whoever they hired, he or her, uh, would be uh, in charge of implementing some of these things. Uh, I stepped off the committee at that time uh, uh, Dr. Holcomb was uh, hired. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly what year he was hired uh, as a result of that search. And uh, you would have to talk to uh, uh, Executive Director Holcomb as to when he, whether any of these were actually implemented at that point uh, moving forward. Because I, I, mean, I wouldn't have personal knowledge of whether it was or not. Okay, I was told that it wasn't um, because there was definitely a conflict between the medical school and the cancer center directors and that um, they, uh, Holcomb didn't want to have any kind of combination, any kind of synergy and wanted to continue to work as a separate entity. And so none of those plans, none of the studies were implemented and uh, we are still subsidizing the cancer center approximately three million plus dollars each year from the general fund. Is that correct? Well, I, I, I can tell you based on uh, Region Portnoy and my, my own uh, investigation in 2016, that at that time, uh, there was some degree of tension between 
uh, the faculty uh, of the cancer center and the medical school. I think at that time, to be very frank, there was a feeling that the cancer center would become uh, a department within the uh, medical school. And uh, I guess they didn't wanna be in that position. Um, so that there was a, little, a bit of tension between the two, two schools that was uh, voiced to me directly by uh, several of the faculty members that we interviewed. So um, uh, that's why we didn't uh, propose an, uh, a, a, a merger of the schools together but rather a consolidation of the operational and administrative functions uh, of the two schools uh, as, a, as part of the business plan. So why wasn't that administrative consolidation done? If it was going to save monies, uh, you know, because here we are now in the pandemic, which means spending more funding. Right, I, I think you would have to address that to Executive Director, Dr. Holcomb because he's been operating the facility uh, since we did the, since we hired him. Yeah, but Ben, you, you guys are the regents. Don't you folks oversee? Don't you folks have the ability to, I mean, you did the investigation, you folks did the study, you did the recommendation. Uh, well, I, when Holcomb came on, I believe what he was doing, and, and Dr. Ramos can correct me if I'm wrong, he proposed to come up with his own uh, plan of reorganization and how he was going to um, uh, reduce the uh, deficit at the cancer center. And so uh, there was a bit of pause with regard to him developing that plan and reporting back. But did he report on it and get back to you guys? He did, uh, yeah, I think I about a year, a year or so later. Um, and and uh, apparently conditions had improved. Uh, uh, with regard to uh, two things. One was the internal uh, morale and, 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 and uh, uh, personnel issues that, that they were, they were uh, not in a very good situation prior to Holcomb coming. And number two, that there was improvement being done uh, to, the, to the financial situation, although um, my understanding, and, and Dr. Ramos can correct me, is that we still subsidize the cancer center to the extent of about three to four million a year. Uh, and that was, the legislature had given us that uh, amount uh, since about 2016 when, when we went back to them. So now, you have a question. Um, Yeah, sorry. Um, probably the question is for Mr. Bruno or uh, Mr. Ramos, since he was on the on the task force that that took a look at some of these issues. And I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm just a little confused on how will you characterize the nature of uh, the cancer center? Is it is it a it's not an independent cancer center affiliated with a university because it's not listed in the appendix as being that it's actually listed as being um, a cancer center within a university. So I don't, I'm trying to understand uh, the distinction that is in a lot of the testimony saying that somehow this change would affect your status with, with NCI. Um, so I might, I might maybe jump in here first, Senator. Um, the, uh, the Board of Regents have the authority and the sole authority to establish what we call an organized research unit at the University of Hawaii. And if you look at executive policy, there are, there are specific conditions on the establishment of what we call an ORU. Among those is the commitment of dedicated university resources to that organized research unit. So we are talking about uh, something discussed as a subsidy. It is far from that. It is a commitment of university funds for the operation, just as we do with the Institute for Astronomy, the operation of a research unit that we regard as essential to the state 
and also as deserving of a long-term commitment. So that designation goes back, I believe, to 1984. So um, more than 40 years ago. Um, And I just want to add one other thing, Um, Chair, the finances are vastly improved from 2016. I can tell you since the Cancer Center director reports to me that the Cancer Center is no longer running a deficit. It had been running a deficit. And from, from when the new director arrived, work was focused not on the Warburg report, but on the designation as a National Institute of Health. National oh, Cancer Institute Center. Hang on, hang on to that because I, I will tell you differently. But Senator Agaron, I'm sure, is going to want to continue on. Or are you done? Did he you answer your question? Uh, somewhat. I mean, I understood that they were a research organization. So are you saying that all of the units that are listed, all the university cancer centers are organized the same way throughout the country? Um, no, they are not, and I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Professor Ramos uh, answer that. There's, there's a, a number of different models, so Joe, maybe you can take that. Well, no, yeah. I'm only interested in that one model where the university is listed, but it's, so it's the items from 20, on page 19 from 24, starting with the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania down to the Yale Cancer Center. I mean... How many of them are directly reporting to um, their own dean or their own um, their own uh, head versus, you know, maybe reporting to the head of the um, uh, medical school as what the bill as the bill would propose? So what was what was has been described to me by our visiting committee is that the NIH requires that the director of a university cancer center, an NIH designated cancer center at a university, the director must be at the same level as a dean at that university. And so for that reason, the director, uh, Dr. Holcomb right now, reports to me as do all of the deans. So that seems to be the, uh, the uniform definition across the uh, United States. And we don't have to change that. That can still occur with a consolidation. So now, Verano, you... No, no, that, that's it. That's, I was just curious. Uh, if I may, the answer to your question is two pages later, there's a table that tells who how the reporting structure is set in that uh, white paper that you're referring to, page 22. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Bruno, shall we go back? Uh, you said that the cancer center is not in a deficit. There's not going to be new general funds, additional general funds other than what they have in the tobacco funds. Is that what you're saying, claiming? No, they have an operating budget. They have revenues and they have expenses. And the for the last three years, the expenses, and for the first time in a long time, have not been exceeding the revenues and their operating budget comes, yes, partially from the general fund allocation to the university. But But that is the same at every other organized research unit. No, they're supposed to be working off of the the funding from the tobacco tax. They're not supposed to be getting any funding from the general fund or any kind of subsidy. And we've had to do that over the last so many years And I just have a letter from the governor on March 27, 2020, saying he's approving the release of $2,871,000 from UH's FY20 general fund contingency restrictions, understand that the funds will be used to support the general operating expenses of the cancer center to help it maintain its National Cancer Institute designation. So they are continuing to be subsidized. So when you folks say that they're not, and that they are, they are self-sustaining, they are not. So we can take this money away then and they can continue to operate. Is that what you're saying? I believe as I recall, and Dr. Ramos can correct me, uh, that release of funding 
uh, coincided with the application of the Cancer Center for a five-year renewal of their, their designation. And um, I believe that those, the release of those funds uh, continued to keep that designation in strong shape. But Dr. Ramos has more detailed knowledge, I'm sure. Very briefly, we're very thankful that the governor uh, did offer that funding. Uh, it really you know, helped us uh, run some new initiatives here, but uh, we don't anticipate that that funding will continue and we've already rebudgeted uh, to uh, allow for the 2 million no longer coming into the center. So we should be just fine this coming year as well, all other things being equal, uh, even without the governor's 2 million. Okay, well, that's good to know. I certainly appreciate that, Mr. Ramos. Um, certainly, uh, that's one area we can hopefully look for more efficiencies as we're moving forward. Now, also in the testimony, it was stated that this bill would threaten the NCI designation. And at no time during the whole Robert study uh, was there any mention or uh, when they mentioned um, or recommended some kind of consolidation that the NCI would be threatened. In fact, what they do state on page five of the report to the regents, the regents, that's your folks' report, Ben. Um, <clears throat> It says the NCI Cancer Center require faculty to earn 80% of their annual compensation through research activity and clinical practice subsidy. To maximize and incentivize faculty productivity, the center must modify. And that the, um, well, let me see, let me read the rest of that. Okay, the center must modify its present faculty compensation model and its research support investment process to optimize its resources. The following phase 1B initiatives address the needed change in faculty compensation required for the center to allow sustainable growth needed to meet the university's NCI designation retention objective. So, you know, when we talk about this bill, we must talk about other areas in which uh, was brought up in the Warburg as to if there's anything that's threatening the NCI um, designation. I, I think we, we really have to focus on results. Um, I, we can look back at that report, but the fact is that when the new director came in, as Chair Kudo has also indicated, the, uh, the morale and the productivity of the Cancer Center faculty increased tremendously to the point that he was able to, along with Professor Ramos and the others, put together a winning proposal for the NIH and, and they were successful. And that, that was really an amazing accomplishment in only, as I recall, something like 18 months. Um, and they are now gearing up for another five-year renewal, that that is going to come around at the end of uh, I think next fall. So I'm I'm really focused on the results, and I I have to say um, the results are there in terms of the finances. But I do want to come back, Chair, to your original point, and I think the strong intent of this bill, which the president and I strongly agree with you on, that there needs to be even more synergies developed and even more efficiencies, especially during this very challenging time of the pandemic and the budget outcomes, the budget uh, impacts of, of that pandemic. So we do agree with you. And I, I, would, be, I would be happy to arrange a meeting with myself and, and Dr. Holcomb with you um, and any other members to, to go through this and perhaps have our Dean of the Medical School in that meeting as well, but um, to address head on, you know, the, the challenges and the path forward. Mr. Bruno, thank you, I appreciate that. But you know that we've been working on this for a couple of years now, right? So you folks have had a lot of time to be able to come in and talk about it. And unless I put up a bill like this, then there's, there's no reason for you folks to work on any of this. So these efficiencies, but, um, you know, I would hope that you folks would take it upon yourself to do it and start moving in a direction that when we don't see you doing that, that's why these bills come up. So, you know, 
give us something to work with. Otherwise, we're going to move along the measure to ensure that you folks are looking at some of these deficiencies. Because I appreciate and I congratulate the uh, Cancer Center for the improvements uh, since Mr. Cardone has left. There were a lot of improvements to be made and they've done that and, and I, we appreciate it. But as you've said, times have changed and now we are in a whole different situation, which is even more dire. And the university needs to become more efficient. There needs to be some changes. Now, we look at consolidation, it shouldn't be threatening. It shouldn't be where one is reporting to the other. I'm sure with all the knowledge at the university, that we can find a way to combine this very two entities that are really have, have similar kinds of missions uh, to help the people of Hawaii to, to medically support our community, to come together and put their differences aside so we can promote and, and make University of Hawaii more efficient and to be able to serve the people of Hawaii. That is our goal. And it shouldn't be silos. It shouldn't be who's in charge of which department and which department is going to oversee which department. I, I think that that's very childish and that we need to move away from that and work together. Uh, I agree and I don't know how we're going to do that if we're not going to to somehow put these measures on the floats, and I don't like to do that. I rather the regents do it. I rather the president do it. That you know, th this is your folks with Kuliana. But if you're going to spend taxpayers' money, tuition dollars to fund these studies, spend time on all of these studies, and then not implement anything, I mean that's ridiculous. And so we are, as responsible legislators overseeing the university need to write a file to say, come on, you folks have to start making some inroads and show us that you're moving in this direction. Chair, I agree with every word you just said. And I, I just, I do want to say that, and I, I think you know this and we've talked about it, there, there's a lot of change going on at the university. And I think the culture, the culture is changed uh, to where the faculty and the staff and the administration are all, I think, getting used to the notion of change and, and the need for positive change. And I'm, I am not gonna sit here and say that uh, everything's great and it's perfect at Kaka'ako, it is, it is not. We need more shared services, shared clinical environment, shared responsibilities for patient care and for clinical trials. Um, we need all of that. And, Certainly, uh, Chair Kudo and the board, we, we have had these conversations from time to time, the president also. So um, there's a commitment to that change, I can Thank assure you. you. And I do appreciate your work in, with the um, classifications and the workload. And you know, so appreciate that and appreciate you saying that you folks are willing to meet. But you know, simple ask that we did during the budget briefing was to get the updated business plan for the Cancer Center clinical trials. And I get a flimsy report that doesn't even look like a business plan. I mean, that's really an insult to give me something to say, this satisfies your answer or your question or request for a updated business plan that is a resemble a business plan. So what am I to think, Bruno, that, you know, that when we ask, the legislature asks for a business plan that should have been put together, it, before spending $13 million for a clinical, to build out the clinical trials, and they can't pro even produce a business plan. I, I, I think that there was some, uh, I know that there were some concerns about proprietary information. Uh, that's not an excuse, but I, I think that in the short time period, uh, what you saw was, uh, maybe the best effort, and if it's not good enough, then uh, we can come back to you with a with a better product. Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't let you get away with that because a couple of years ago when we brought this up, we were given a business plan. Two years ago, when, or was it a year ago, when we had Mr. Holcomb in front of us, he gave me a one and a half page business plan. And we questioned him on that business plan. And I expected that we would have an updated business plan today, over a year later. And then I didn't even get that. So it's not as if, you know, this question or requests have come out of the clear blue sky. This is something we've been asking for. These are concerns we have about the numbers for the clinical trials. 
So Mr. Kuda, have you folks received an updated business plan for the clinical trials? No, uh, no, but um, lim uh, let me make this offer, uh, Senator Kim. Um, I will, on the behalf of the regions, uh, put this on the uh, appropriate subcommittee's agenda to follow up uh, to obtain a, a, an acceptable business plan on the uh, cancer center and, and in particular the clinical trials uh, side of it uh, in the next uh, few months. Okay, well, we're, we're planning to have a budget briefing on the University of Hawaii's budget on Thursday, and I want to go over the, the cancer center budget for okay. the clinical trials and also a report because my understanding is that it's still questionable whether or not the clinical trials are going to make any money or bring in any funding. Are you have any idea about that, Mr. Kudo? Well, again, my information is dated, and and I, I, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ramos can correct me, but as I understand the situation with clinical trials, is is that um, there's no money in it. In other words, revenue is not really generated of any sufficient amount to, um, to justify uh, the program itself. The way that um, uh, schools or cancer research centers make money off of clinical trials is that the universities have a hospital where the testing and lab work and all those other secondary attendant types of services are the ones that generate the monies from the clinical trial program itself. As, as I understand it, Cancer Center in particular, our Cancer Center does not uh, do clinical trials for uh, your run of the mill types of cancer. And I don't, I don't wanna use the run of the mill, uh, you know, in, in any, um, um, I yeah, I wanna be sensitive for people that do have cancer, but you know, lung cancer and those kinds of cancers are not treated by the clinical trials. They, they, they deal with the rare forms of cancer forms that are unique to the tropics and, and, and our area uh, are dealt with with uh, experimental uh, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, in those clinical trials. And based, a few words? based on our population in Hawaii, the number of people that are fall into that particular category, you're not, you, you don't see the numbers like you see in some states where the cancer center is located in a metropolis much larger than than uh, our state. So um, at least in 2016, that's what was being told to us uh, uh, by, by, the, um, by people that were um, affiliated with the cancer clinical programs. Okay, Mr. Ramos, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just want uh, to make a, a couple of quick comments on that because we actually run clinical trials all the time on very prevalent cancers in Hawaii. That's one of the things we're really attentive to. What, what's special about clinical trials is that they're the early phase things that we're interested in here. They're the things that are experimental therapeutics. So these are new treatments. And a lot of really predominant cancers don't have good treatments still. Uh, and we're always trying to make those treatments fit uh, our population as well. So there are a number of clinical trials that we have around lung cancer and breast cancer. That's something that we actually spend a lot of effort and time on. There's also uh, the, the early phase clinical trials unit itself is going to specialize in what we call these phase one trials, which are the very cutting edge therapeutics. They're kind of the treatments of tomorrow, if you will. It's an investment in trying to find the new cures, the new treatments that are gonna save patients uh, tomorrow. We have about 7,000 patients a year in Hawaii, actually. So we have quite a few. Uh, a large proportion of those are breast cancers. There are a lot of disparities. Native Hawaiians uh, have a, a greater mor morbidity uh, and, uh, and have, let and fare less well on some of the treatments we currently have. So we're really working to try and find ways to do that. And by the way, we're doing this with the consortium of hospitals. I wanted to emphasize that. That is something that we do. We have the Hawaii Cancer Consortium that we work with, and that is HPH and Queens and we've Kuakini and we've added the Castle Group, Adventist uh, Castle Health. Um, and so we work very closely with them. We meet with them quarterly to make sure we're all aligned together in this fight. And they're the ones who are gonna be helping us do the clinical trials in that. And that is funded by NIH. So it's a CO6 grant. So the money is already there. We're already, uh, uh, NIH is monitoring our progress on this. They're looking to see how we're doing with it. Uh, and thank, thank you. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we lost seen, uh, Senator Breen Harimoto just this past year to pancreatic cancer, but it was his initiative that really helped fund the other part of it to find that matching fund. 
Uh, and it's all, it's gonna be all about Hawaii and how we can make a difference here for the patients. Um, and the other comment, by the way, is that this report was by Jairus Hedges. He actually requested this report, not the Board of Regents. And this is the part that's Warburg. And the first part of it's all Jairus, just to make that comment. And it has really changed since then. the same report that I have, um, Mr. Ramos, just so you know that. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's the same one. I was, I was here for, for these reports. Um, and they really are ancient history now. It's uh, so much has changed since then. Um, but, but we really, nevertheless, I want to th I thank the legislature for having been there to, to support cancer research and cancer treatments in the islands for all these years. Good question, because we're going to have to move on to the next agenda item. So with all of that said, is the clinical trials are going to be self-sustaining and not going to have to be subsidized uh, by no. the legislature or funding? No, Dr. Holcomb has made, there's no, we had never even thought to do that, frankly. Uh, the, those trials will be funded by, um, some of it will be funded by industry who want to test their drugs in our patients here to make sure that they work well for our population. Okay, and some I of them will be funded is, by grants. You're not, you're not going to be coming to the legislature in the future to ask us to subsidize, correct? No, we will not ask you to subsidize the early phase clinical trials unit. And we have no intention to come in. We haven't asked for money from you guys ourselves in the last several years. Okay. That was part of our mission when Dr. Holcomb came in is we got our finances in alignment. Uh, because we knew that this was not something that you all wanted to hear. And that it was certainly something we wanted to get. Again, we're very interested in efficiencies ourselves here. And so that's something that he focused on when he came in. Okay, thank you for that. Sure. Members, if there are no other questions, I'm gonna move on to our, our next agenda item. Um, is that okay? Yes, because we're running out of time here. Okay, thank you very much. That was a really healthy discussion. We're on uh, Senate Bill 1024 relating to education establishes a uh, cannabinoid <laughs> medicine program, the University of Hawaii to be administered by the John A. Burns School of Medicine. Uh, and to testify on this is Jerry Hedges in opposition, Cliff Odo in support. Mr. Odo, how are you? Good afternoon, Chair. Very fine, thank you. Um, Chair, Vice Chair, thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify in this measure, SB 1024. I just um, want to say that you, you recommended this. I introduced this measure. So thank you for being here to testify on it. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Would you like me to proceed with my testimony? Yes, please. Great. So um, I, I'm in, str in strong support of this measure um, for a number of reasons. And one of them is that um, I, I think that it just makes sense from a medical and educational perspective. We've had a, a medical cannabis program for 21 years and uh, still don't have really proper representation uh, at the medical school. Um, and, and I think a lot of the, the, you know, if there's an issue with cannabis that's directed to the medical school, it's usually taken up by uh, uh, professors in the addiction uh, department. And, and I don't think this really fully represents the potential of the study of cannabinoid medicine. I can see how maybe one of the concerns of the committee and, and perhaps uh, the medical school is uh, the current situation with the federal conflict with the, the regulation of marijuana and, and that having programs like this might somehow jeopardize that kind of funding. Um, I, I would point you to the state of Iowa, which uh, addressed this issue last year. The legislature had concerns about funding being uh, held from educational uh, facilities because of medical cannabis patients using uh, cannabis on site. And they uh, mandated their Department of Public Health to come up with a solution uh, for this conflict. And they came up with the idea of a federal exemption uh, that is now waiting the governor of Iowa's approval. And that's why I included this particular amendment in my testimony today. If there is a concern that uh, this program would somehow put the university at risk of losing federal funding, then this would be a way to address that concern. Uh, and perhaps this is a, such a substantive change that it would require a, a proposed uh, SD1. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. But in any case, uh, I'm hoping that this, this new program will allow the school to fulfill the mission of the original medical cannabis bill, which was to make Hawaii a international center for research and treatment for medical cannabis. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Wendy Gibson uh, also in support and Thaddeus Pham also in support. Anyone else wishing to testify? If not, I do have a question for you, um, Mr. Odo. 
So Jobson is saying that the, Jobson already employs faculty with expertise in substance abuse, which includes marijuana, THC. And Jobson also has both an addiction psychiatry uh, fellowship and a separate fellowship in addiction medicine. It has an existing curriculum throughout all four years of medical school and its residency and fellowship programs that addresses substance abuse. And so basically they're saying that um, they don't need this. In light of the curriculum and other faculty activities already in existence, which provide education and training, we believe that creating another separate course of study uh, would duplicate Jobson's current educational efforts in the field. Do you agree with that? Well, um, you know, I would say that, and the one word that I keep hearing is this word abuse and, uh, and psychiatry. Uh, this unfortunately is currently the way medical cannabis is being approached by the medical school. It's all about addiction and abuse. And we have nearly 30,000 patients who are registered uh, under state authorization to gauge in the use of cannabis for medical purposes and, and their needs and, and their outcomes are not being addressed currently. Um, and so I believe that the school needs to have what you could call a certified cannabinoid medicine specialist, meaning somebody who's been certified by an accrediting board in the United States, uh, and there are at least one that I know of, uh, they currently offer certification in the uh, cannabinoid medicine specialty area. And so I believe that the medical school needs to have uh, a staff member who is an expert in this field to be properly represented at the medical school, especially with the number of patients who are using medical cannabis and especially with the research potential in this field. Um, you know, I was hearing a lot about uh, need for uh, revenue at the medical school and, uh, and the cancer center. And I think there's a huge potential for research in this area. If we can just do something to get rid of this conflict with the federal regulation of marijuana, which I think the state is well within its authority to do something about. Okay, thank you. Members, questions? So now go on, question. Senator Favela, not? Okay, thank you very much. We are going to move thank on you. to our uh, next uh, number four, uh, Senate Bill 613. And this is relating to physician workforce assessment repeals the requirement that no less than 50% of the physician workforce assessment fees deposited into the Johnny Byrne School of Medicine Special Fund be used for purposes identified by the Hawaii Medical Education Council, repeals the monetary cap of expenditures from the Johnny Byrne School of Medicine Special Fund, authorizes Johnny Byrne School of Medicine Special Fund to provide loan repayment to certain physicians and scholarships to qualify medical students. And uh, we have Alani Huigo, not saying I'm saying your name correctly, I'm sorry, um, from DCCA with comments, Director uh, uh, Pereira with comments, and Jerry Hedges, University of Hawaii, and Kelly Woody in support. And I believe Kitty, Kelly, you're with us. Yes, thank you. Aloha. Uh, and Vice Chair Kidani, uh, I will stand on our testimony uh, in strong support and be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to testify in this measure? Madam Chair, uh, JC Mikeylanik, on behalf of uh, Queen's Health System, we stand in strong support. Yes, we have Colette Matsunaga, but you are, uh, would you like to testify? I'm just standing on our uh, testimony in strong support, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Also Elizabeth Ann Ignacio from Hawaii Medical Association and Eric Abe, primary, Hawaii Primary Care Association, also in support. Okay, I do have um, some uh, questions. I'm not sure who can answer this at this point. Um, how much funding are we going to need for this or is all of it coming out of the Physician Workforce Fund? And how much would, is that anticipating? So all of it will come out of the Physician Workforce Fund, which is a result of the physicians paying $60 each when they relicense every other year. So there is, because there's a cap on this fund of $245,000 a year, there is a reserve of $500,000 sitting there that we cannot spend. 
we also get in about $50,000 a year more than we're allowed to spend because there are over 10,000 licensed physicians these days. So we have right now uh, 15 loan repairs that we're paying off their loans uh, on all the islands and we have an additional 17 applicants. And so if we were going to fund them all, we would need about $600,000 but um, we don't need to fund them all. And of the ones who are physicians, if we had about 250,000, we could fund all of those. And then we have commitments from uh, five different organizations to help fund the non-physicians. So this is physician money. It would only go to physicians. And we think that there will be some left over and even on a year to year basis that we could fund students even from rural areas to go to medical school with much less expense than they currently have. Great, that's like music to our ears. Mm -hmm. if there's any qu other questions you might have? If not, great, thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, testimony. Thank you for all your hard work. Okay. Thank you. We are going on to our uh, last item. Our last item, we have 10 minutes left, I'm told. Uh, Senate Bill 1225. Uh, this is University of Hawaii Board of Regents Independent Audit Committee allows the chair of the Independent Audit Committee of the University of Hawaii Regents to be selected in the manner consistent with its bylaws and make other clarifying amendments. And uh, we have Kendra uh, Oishi. Kendra, welcome. Hi, Hi welcome. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Kim, Vice Chair Kidani, uh, members of the committee, Kendra Oishi, Executive Administrator and Secretary of the Board of Regents, testifying in support of this bill, which uh, we requested to be introduced. So thank you uh, for hearing it. Um, we are requesting one additional amendment, which would allow the committee, the Independent Audit Committee, to meet with internal and external auditors on confidential matters in executive session and for to allow those discussions to occur without the presence of uh, university management. Um, during a December independent audit committee meeting, um, the university's in external auditors conducted a professional development session for the committee, um, which included the topic of executive sessions and um, during that meeting, the external auditors noted that uh, executive sessions are uh, a valuable tool for audit committees to carry out their responsibilities. Um, currently, the executive sessions are limited to very specific circumstances. So we are asking that the committee be allowed to meet in executive session with internal and external auditors um, so that the board may carry out their fiduciary responsibilities to the university. Uh, more effectively. And thank you and available for any questions. Thank you. I will have a question for you. Uh, next um, testifier is Jennifer Morrow in opposition. Jennifer, are you online? Mm. No? Okay, she did sign up to speak. Okay, I do have a question. So Kendra, why, why do the board need us to do this statutorily? Um, with regard to the requested amendment or the uh, the yeah. original bill? Original bill, yeah. Oh, so the, um, currently, so the, the bill, the statute right now uh, is such that the independent audit committee members uh, elect the committee chair, um, which is inconsistent with the board bylaws, uh, which allow the board chair to um, select committee chairs so that, you know, the board chair can look at everything um, holistically. Uh, the reason this came about actually was, you know, we had a regent who served as the independent audit committee chair for several years. Um, and last year that regent had termed off. And so there was kind of an awkward gap where we had no um, committee chair, and that happens at the same time where, um, you know, board, the board is also selecting board leadership. Um, so when it came time to plan the first independent audit committee meeting of the, the planning year, um, there was basically no chair to work with to plan 
uh, for that committee. So there's certain kind of standard things that we can put on the agenda, but- The board uh, chair couldn't make an appointment? The board, chair couldn't, the board chair couldn't make a, a, a audit, audit chair? Couldn't appoint an audit chair? Uh, no, because the, the statute requires that the audit chair is elected by the members of the committee. And so, so the, at, in, in this particular circumstance, the regent who had served as the chair had termed off um, on June 30, but uh, board leadership is not elected until the first committee after June 30. Um, so, you know, the board, the, the new board chair would not have been elected until maybe about three weeks after that time. Um, you know, and that's all done in a public meeting, so. So it's three weeks of detrimental. I guess I'm just not really understanding why this is really needed. Uh, oh, I get two things. So one, one thing is just for planning purposes, um, you know, planning the first committee meeting of the, the, the academic year, which is what the regents go by. So basically like along the lines of the fiscal year. Um, you know, there's basically, there's potentially, you know, no one to plan the agenda other than the standard items. Um, and the second thing is that the, the board chair is the one who appoints all of the other committee chairs. So currently we have seven uh, committees per the bylaws with 11 regents. And so um, in order for the the board chair to effectively, you know, kind of evenly spread the workload among all of the regents, it would be helpful for him to be able to have the ability to select um, the independent audit committee chair um, the way that he selects. For some reason, then the audit committee is elected differently, the chair is elected differently than every other committee for some right. reason. And it's right. by statute, then we have to amend it. Sorry, I missed that last part that you said. So it's by statute that we have to amend it because it's right, a statute. Right. Which is Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, any questions? Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank, um, thank you. So uh, members, um, we are going to uh, make decision on Tuesday, February 16th at 3.05 in room 229. At this point, uh, there are some measures that I would like to offer amendments uh, to that in light of some of the testimony received. So is there any objections to decision making on Tuesday, February 16th? Do we have a committee meeting anyway that day at 3.05 p.m. and then 2 to 9? Hearing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>